Well, good morning, Christ Church. So, uh, Pastor Byron was just uh, talking about praising together and uh, how good it is because we can extend each other's faith and we're uh, these beautiful moments even when people next to you can't sing. Uh, I don't know if he said that before, but it just happens to be while I was standing next to him singing. And so uh, I, I don't know if that just came, my, my vocals, I'm a better preacher than I am singer, but it is an uh, absolute privilege to stand next to you and worship and to stand with all of you and worship as we have. And so bless you guys, take a seat. Uh, it really is just a great joy to, to be with you. Uh, as I've said in, in a couple uh, of the environments that we've had, I, I, we don't take this for granted. Uh, this is, uh, you're a group of people that have been well loved, have been pastored, have been shepherded, have been put into formation, and uh, I have the privilege of coming and standing before you, uh, actually on the toil and the prayers and the love and the sweat of uh, pastors and the community. And so I just want to thank you for welcoming me, thank you for opening your hearts to what I trust God wants to say to us today. Through, uh, through me. And so I, I really do uh, pray as John the Baptist prayed, less of me and more of him. Uh, that really is my attitude and disposition this morning as I speak to you. And so we do pray, Spirit of God, that you would come upon each of us. We thank you that your attention is towards us. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you that your desire is that we would live life to the full and have it in abundance. And... Uh, I know with certainty that there is more for each one of us. And so your work is not finished in us, and we trust that you would continue to refine us and shape us and renew us and encourage us and inspire us and strengthen us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, C.S. Lewis is a man that uh, I, I've never met but uh, never did meet and really came to enjoy the way he communicated and wrote. And if you've never read anything of C.S. Lewis's, I really do encourage you to do it. But he uh, coined this phrase called chronological snobbery. Yeah, big, big fancy language. Chronological snobbery. And effectively what it means is chronological, so it's kind of like a timeline, all right? And so chronological, uh, snobbery being that we think we're better than or, yeah, that we think we're better than. And so chronological snobbery is this idea that every generation thinks they're cleverer than the, other, the previous generation. Anyone got teenagers? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we, we know that chronological snobbery is real. It exists. And, uh, and those of you that are, are sitting here with the wisdom of gray hair uh, know that of guys kind of my age, you're also looking at us and kind of going, yeah, 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 you also think, not just the teenagers, you also think that you're cleverer than us. And uh, we live in an, in an age where it's just this rampant raging against God's pattern and way. And so this chronological snobbery is a very real thing as we particularly look in, in culture today and so much of our culture is influenced by America and we, we have this Western philosophy that is driving what freedom and truth looks like and means. I, I, I find it absolutely fascinating how God has dovetailed uh, what Pastor Byron was just saying around uh, just truth and freedom as he was landing worship and what I'm wanting to just speak to us today about our own freedom and truth. And... Uh, we have this society that wants to rage against us, and uh, the, the, the sociologists uh, would say this, the people that study human science would say that this generation, the cultural shift that we are facing is like no other generation prior, because the very thought of God is no longer the centerpiece of culture. And so that has three ramifications for us, so the sociologists would tell us. One, that we have moved from the majority to the minority. Those of us that follow Jesus have moved in our thinking, in our value set, in our culture to the minority. And so in the past, even though uh, most nations uh, would claim to be Christian, and we know that they, that wouldn't mean necessarily followers of Jesus, constitutions, culture, uh, ethos of how cities were designed and how they formed was all based on Christian principles. Not, to, not so today. In fact, the Barna Group, which is a Christian think tank, has said the number of resilient disciples, that people that truly follow Jesus and are obedient to his patterns, 
and the design of God for our lives would be at less than 10%. Number two, we see that Christianity has moved from a place of honor to a place of shame. It's now shameful to be Christian in the Western world. Now, I get that we are not, I'm not preaching to just the Western world here. I'm so grateful for our African uh, context, which is different to the West. I'm just saying there is, there is a culture that we live and move and have our being amongst and that we have to uh, continue to fight for the things of God. And you see, uh, when we move from a place of honor to a place of shame, what it means is the church is no longer seen as part of the solution to culture's ills, to society's ills, but actually we're seen as part of the problem. And then the third thing is this, that uh, the world in, in terms of Christianity has moved from widespread tolerance, like it's, it's okay for you to be a Christian, it's not my gig, but it's okay for you, to actually increasing hostility. So no, but no longer are people thinking that we're just weird, they're actually thinking we're dangerous. And so in the midst of this, we have this cry in the human heart of freedom, because God's designed us for freedom. And so there's these conflicting emotions in this world. There's the conflicting ideas that we think that this generation is actually smarter than the previous generation. And so our idea of freedom is better than those that have gone before us. I want to flip that thing completely on its head today. Because it actually doesn't matter if this generation is smarter or isn't smarter than previous generations. Or these ideas are better than other ideas. I'm not actually interested in that. Because actually, as a people of God, we are called to be symbolic of things to come. And it's what our future is that orientates us towards how we live today. Not in terms of what our past is and what the present ideas are. And so we're going to get into that. But Jesus says this in John chapter 8. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples. If you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples. And as a result, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's that encounter that Jesus has with this man called Pilate who was a Roman ruler uh, just as he was going to go to the cross. And Pilate is questioning him and Pilate says, so you're a king. And Jesus says, well, you say I'm a king, but actually all those that follow me land on the side of truth. And Pilate goes, aha, what is truth? And ever since Pilate has said that, humanity has tried to understand what truth is. But as those that are following Jesus, those I love this, be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what Jesus did to those of us that truly have centered ourselves on the saving grace of Jesus Christ and want to follow in his patterns, believing that the design of life from God eternal and God in heaven is good and it is for our blessing. And Jesus came not only to be our savior, but also to model what that looks like. We've got to start paying attention more to how Jesus lived than to the ideas of this day. You see, contrary to popular imaginations, the devil is not in hell right now. And as Jesus taught us to pray um, uh, on earth as it is in heaven, the devil's mantra is on earth as it is in hell. And so we have this very real confrontation that sociologists say is doing our head in because it is such a big shift that the idea of God is a preposterous idea in today's day and age. As we see that the boomers had a, a, an acceptance rate of Jesus Christ at 10%, and then it went down to the Gen Xs at 7%, and then to the Gen Zs at 6%, uh, uh, to the millennials at 6%, and then to the Gen Zs at 4%, we see this, this downhill trajectory of people following Christ because we're smarter then. How can there be God? God is us. My idea is cleverer than those silly boomers who had this idea of someone beyond them. C.S. Lewis says this, There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Friends, we need to understand we are in a spiritual battle. We are not neutral. 
There is no neutral ground. If we are not making decisions for Jesus, we have to understand the natural laws of a broken world is this word called diabolos, which is to pull apart, to separate, to degenerate, to move towards chaos. We need to understand if we are not taking steps in obedience around Christ's pattern and design, we are moving towards separation, isolation, chaos. But there is good news in all of this. There's good news in all of this. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8, and this is my anchor text for today. Listen, high priest Joshua. So Zechariah is a, is a prophet. He's a man used by God to speak to the people of God. And he says, listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates, your associates seated before you. Let me just stop there for a second as we appropriate this text for ourselves. We need to understand that we've been called priests. We are a royal priesthood now. And so actually we can start to read this text within our own lens. And so although Zechariah was literally preaching to this man Joshua and was literally preaching to the people around him, we can so read this text to you, Pastor Byron, as a priest amongst people and to all your associates seated here before me. Okay, we're going to read the text through that lens. You are men symbolic of things to come. And I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. We know that to be Jesus if we study the scriptures. And so listen to me, friends, Thrive Church, sitting before me today. Listen to me. You are men and women, symbolic of things to come, because Jesus has come, and He has altered our lives forever, changed, and we're going to look at something of what that means. You see, the greater truth that we have to live by is Jesus today. The greater truth is Jesus, and we, we, we live by something of this coming kingdom. See, we know there is a day where Jesus is going to come and take us to be in that coming kingdom where there will be no more sickness, disease, sin, rebellion, uh, disobedience. We know that that day is coming and we have this privilege of living in this in-between of Jesus having come to inaugurate that kingdom, but it's not fully here yet. It's like that battle. Jesus on the cross was like D-Day for World War II. That decisive battle that got fought and won. And so, although World War II wasn't ended... The enemy, Germany, just was kind of going around like a wounded dragon, in a sense. I and mean, I'm really mixing my metaphors here. Was, was just like a wounded dragon. The war, the war, the decisive battle had been won, but they hadn't yet signed the final treaty. And we live in that. The, the decisive battle has been won by Jesus, and we have this coming kingdom. And Jesus taught us to pray, let us live. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And therefore, what helps us live today is being drawn to the coming kingdom. It's the coming kingdom which should define how we live today. Not a recovery of our pasts, as good as that may be. Not based on the ideas and ideology of today. Not based on whether a preacher a hundred years ago was uh, just significantly, had such great ideas and grand ideas. I think of Charles Spurgeon, who I absolutely love the way he was able to express things. I love what he's offered me, but he doesn't define the way I live. The coming kingdom defines the way I live. There's this massive basket building in the USA, it looks like this. And it was the headquarters of the Longeberger Basket Company. And once upon a time, they had 8,500 employees and well over a billion dollars worth of annual revenue. And uh, they had an idea to help people carry their food from, shopping center, from, sh from shops to home. That was the idea, they wanted to help serve people and so in their creative design, they came up with this idea of a basket. And they sold like hotcakes. Baskets were the big rage 100 years ago. And they were so uh, convinced of this, the product that they had designed that they built their headquarters to look like that. What happens? Cheap plastic comes in. They go out of business. Because they forgot somewhere along the line that their dream was to help people. And they became so convinced of the way they help people that they forgot about the service that they were offering. That building now they can't sell because it's custom built. 
they bankrupt and no one wants to buy it. And so I want to keep reminding us that we live in this coming, we, we're drawn by this coming kingdom. We are symbolic of things to come, but we live in today's day and age and our call is to be a missional people and a, a, a people that want to help others to lead them to life. But we cannot get so stuck in the product that we serve to meet that need because otherwise we too will become like the generation where the next generation will say, your ideas are old school. Our ideas are better. The beauty of us is we hold to the love of Jesus Christ. We hold to the coming kingdom. We can change how we do things because our heart is to see people come to freedom. Let's look at this, what Jesus did in his service for us. See, Adam and Eve were disobedient to the Father in the garden. Adam and Eve were disobedient to the Father in the garden. So what does Jesus do? He goes to the garden to be obedient to his father. What else does he do? Adam and Eve hid behind a tree, naked and covered in shame, because they had been disobedient to God and rebelled against him. Adam and Eve hid behind a tree, naked, covered in shame. Jesus goes and hangs on a tree, naked and conquers shame. Adam and Eve's sin ushered in a curse of thorns, so Jesus takes a crown of thorns as he ushers in salvation from sin. Adam and Eve began in paradise, but they forced outside the gates due to the curse. And so Jesus goes to that place outside the gates in order that he and we may end up in paradise due to the cross. Thrive Church, can we be people that are symbolic of things to come I'm going to take some time and just look through these four statements and just how that plays out for us. Is that okay? Can we do that today? Number one, the garden. The garden is a, a representative place that has both disobedience and obedience on offer. Disobedience and obedience on offer. Adam and Eve are disobedient to the Father in the garden. Jesus goes to the garden to be obedient to the Father. See, obedience is not a popular concept today. We have this ideology that says that each of us is our own boss. Each of us is the own holder of truth. Each of us, each of us, each of us. We, we get that. We know that. And uh, that's kind of the culture, the prevailing culture that we live in. And so obedience and disobedience is not something that is uh, often received. But we, the people of God, are different. We are different. And there's the story of Moses, and I shared it with the men on Friday night, and so I'm going to condense it a little bit. But Moses has been leading these Israelites for 40 years in the desert, and they've done nothing but complain. Nothing but complain for 40 years. And now they're saying, well, now we're thirsty. And so Moses goes to God and says, God, all these people that you've put here that are frustrating me no end, they're complaining about water. How am I supposed to just come up with water? And God says, well, just speak to the rock and I will satisfy their thirst. And so Moses says, come all you people. Come here and I will show you. And he strikes the rock and water comes gushing out. And so all the people receive the gift from God. And then God says, Moses, come here, please. I told you to speak to the rock. And in your frustration, you acted disobediently and you didn't represent me as holy. You weren't symbolic of things to come. And so I'm afraid you've led these people for 40 years. They've frustrated you no end, but you're going to lose your earthly inheritance. I tell you, I read that scripture and it terrifies me because I say, how can Moses, who for 40 years has endured a torrid people that have done nothing but complain, and he loses his earthly inheritance, because he strikes a rock and doesn't speak to the rock. And I say, deep is God. Woe is me. How many times have I spoken frustratingly to my kids? Frustratingly to my staff? Frustratingly to my church, Anthem? How many times have I spoken frustratingly? God, please don't deny me my earthly inheritance. You are holy. 
And actually, so there's, there's, a way, there's, there's a way which is symbolic of our past, which is disobedience, and there's a way which is symbolic of things to come, which is obedience. And we have a choice to make, friends. We have a choice to make. I just want to share a story with you, and maybe it encourages uh, all of us, but, but, but maybe even just one person here. So we have a lady who was horribly abused by her husband, and he then left, and, uh, and she was left in financial trouble, and she came to me, and she said, Richard, my, my desire is to follow God's pattern in financial giving and uh, in tithing, but I just cannot afford it. This is what I earned. She was very open with me, and I said, all right, uh, Janine, her name is Janine. She's given me permission to share the story. And I just said, Janine, we've got some decisions to make here. You see, we can be obedient to God's pattern and trust Him with what we, seem, what we believe to be our shortfall. Or we can be disobedient and try to hold on to it ourselves. And I said, so the choice you have to make now is, will you be obedient to the Father? Will you trust Him on His pattern of financial stewardship? And then would you trust the church? to look after you as a single lady. And we went on a journey, and so every month what I encouraged her to do was to bring her tithe. And then I, as I saw the money hit the account, I would phone her, and I'd say, Janine, what do you need this month? As a community, we want to look after you. And that went on for about 18 months, and I received a message about three weeks ago. She just said, Richard, I want to tell you that this is the first month. I don't have to ask the church for help. I've come into freedom financially. And I was just able to say thank you. You now have a testimony of obedience to God and trust in a community that will look after you. Because Jesus' church is where he's put us. And obedience has set her free. If she had never made that call, if she had continued to look after her own self or, or live by the fears of her own way, she would never have made the progress she's had because now she has so much more trust in God for other big decisions she has to make. As she was able to do it in partnership with God, in partnership with the church, in this partnership uh, uh, relationship. You see, her following Jesus' way has brought her greater freedom. And so symbolic of what was, here's a question for you, is where has disobedience cost you? Where's disobedience cost you? And I want to bring you good news. Because Adam and Eve were disobedient and they got kicked out of the garden. And Jesus went straight to the garden to be obedient to the Father, to overturn that forever. And so in your disobedience... In your not following God's patterns, maybe in your marriage, and you've paid the price for it, I want to tell you Jesus has gone there, and he's won a different way for you. If you've made some decisions financially which have not been according to God's pattern, and you're now paying the price for it, I want to tell you that Jesus has gone there, and he's overturned it. If you've made a decision with substances or pornography, that you know is not God's pattern and his way and you feel like you've been kicked out of the garden, I want to tell you Jesus has gone back to the garden to be obedient so that we can have a way to follow. And so where has disobedience cost you? That is not a death sentence for you, friends. It's the way we can come before a merciful God and say, thank you, Jesus, that you taught us a different way. Thank you that I can live by what is symbolic or I can be a person that is symbolic of things to come. I don't have to live by what's already been done. Will you receive that today? And so kind of the ending question for just the garden is what is your obedient action to take? What is your obedient action to take out of today? Secondly, the tree. They hid. They were naked. Uh, uh, but Jesus goes to the tree and is on the tree naked and covers our shame. They hid because they were ashamed, Adam and Eve. Jesus goes to the tree to cover our shame. See, how can we bring honor to people, even as Jesus came to give honor to people? In John chapter 8, we have this incredible passage where Jesus uh, is, uh, it's, an, it's early on a, on, a, on a day of the synagogue, and all the Pharisees are wanting to gather around, and uh, they bring this woman who's been caught in adultery. And they don't say whether she is naked, but if she was caught in the act of adultery, she probably wasn't wearing much. 
And they bring her along into this moment. And here come the Pharisees, and they want to, bring, they want to expose her. They want to, today's current culture, this cancel culture, let me, if you pop your head up, I'm going to cancel you. And so the Pharisees do exactly the same thing. And so just for all you Gen Zs amongst us that think that cancel culture is your culture, uh, just by the way, the Pharisees were doing it first. Uh, you, you're, you're not smarter. You're just repeating the same things that have, humanity has always done. But there's this moment, and Jesus just continues to write, and some of us know the story, but there's this woman in a very vulnerable moment, uh, uh, possibly naked, certainly naked emotionally, full of shame, having been caught in the act of something that she knows she shouldn't have been doing. And these group of people want to live by the laws of the past, and they want to expose her, and they, and they, want, to, they want her to feel shame, and they want to stone her. And Jesus does something completely different. Because he knows he's going to the tree. He knows he's going to be naked on that tree. And he knows he's doing it to conquer shame. And so as men and women, symbolic of things to come. Can we be a community? Can Thrive be a community that doesn't expose people? That doesn't cancel people? That doesn't kind of say, oh, you're this kind of person or you're this kind of person. But rather you're invited in and I'm going to cover your shame. And I'm going to, I'm going to take my clothes off in order to clothe you. I'm going to stand naked and take your shame because I'm symbolic of things to come. I'm so grateful we, we have a, an anthem, addiction recovery, so substance abuse recovery, and, and it's one of our key, uh, key uh, ministries that we do. And uh, there was a man called Chris Lee, uh, and uh, I, I love this man dearly. He's one of my leaders now, but we're going back a few years, and he, he came into this recovery ministry. He had totally, he had stolen from his mom. He had devastated, he had left his wife with a child. Uh, like just uh, all the stuff that we read about substance abuse, this guy was living had lived on the streets. He came in. He started to be clean. And on the eve of his one-year clean uh, journey, he fell back into heroin. And he left. He disappeared. And we couldn't get hold of him, and we didn't know where he was. And three days later, he arrived. He's now gone on that journey of recovery. He's now a number of years clean, and he is one of our leaders in the recovery work. But I asked him, why did you come back? Three days. Why did you come back? He says, I felt nothing but love and covering for my nakedness and exposure in this community. I knew that this was a safe place for me to come and my shame would be taken away. And he's restored with his wife and they're on staff and it is just their most amazing story. And I'm so grateful for Anthem Church and I, and I just share that to say churches can become communities that represent the coming kingdom churches can be communities that represent Jesus, that are prepared to hang ourselves naked on a tree. You, you get what I mean by that? To, to, actually, if you're coming in here naked and you've got nothing to wear, I'm going to take off my clothes so that you can stand covered. Symbolic of things to come. Symbolic of things to come. Cancel culture, symbolic of things to come. What are you going to choose today? Question, are we prepared to be naked in order for others to have their shame removed? And what that may mean for you, friends, is that you're sitting here with shame today. The gospel covers you. And you may have to go on a journey to allow the grace of God to fully permeate you and work its way through you. But I want to say that you are in a community. I know that we've come to know the, the heart of Pastor Byron and Pastor Candace. We've come to know them. We've come to know the community they want to build, what, what we want to be. This is a safe community. Not perfect. And people can sometimes in their ignorance say things that are not helpful. But our intention is that we'll be symbolic of things to come. And so if you are ashamed here, I want to tell you, this is where you can find freedom. This is where you can find covering for your shame. Third, the thorns speaks of curse and blessing. Adam and Eve sin ushered in a curse of thorns, but Jesus wears a crown of thorns as he ushers in salvation from sin. Curse and blessing. Curse and blessing. See, our pasts all have an element of a curse behind it because it is broken. It, it's sinful, our pasts. 
But Jesus has come and changes everything for us. And so symbolic of things to come starts to say, how do we live in the blessing of the grace of God? How do we, how we pull towards that story? And how do we pull that story towards us on earth as it is in heaven? Rather than living with the baggage of, uh, uh, the, baggage of the thorns that grow up amongst everything that we're trying to produce. I love the smell of coffee. I, I'm not a chronological snob, I don't think, but I am a coffee snob. But it's okay. Jesus covers me. <laughs> covers my shame. And one of the things that I love about coffee is the smell. Don't judge me for this. I've even got a little bag of coffee beans in my car just so that it, and it just stays there, so that it just smells of coffee. I do have five very sporty boys. It could also do with trying to cover their smell, uh, you know, <laughs> the greater aroma uh, in, in the car as we, as we go along. But this is one of the things that I always find fascinating. Sometimes we can smell a coffee shop before we see a coffee shop. See, we have the curse of thorns or we receive Jesus' blessing because he wore the thorns. And I want to ask you this question. See, grace has come upon us and we can just receive the grace of God or we can become a product of the grace of God. See, when the grace of God starts to get in amongst us and starts to renew our minds and starts to shape who we are, we start to create an atmosphere and people can start to smell you before they know you're there because the atmosphere has changed. What kind of atmosphere do you set? And just by the way, if I want to know what atmosphere you set, I'm not going to ask you. I'm going to ask your spouse. I'm going to ask your children. I'm going to ask your work colleagues because they'll tell me what kind of atmosphere. Have you become a product of grace? Has grace permeated you? Has it got through you? Has it got through every thought and, and every being so that actually there's, there's an atmosphere. When you walk into a room, the atmosphere changes because grace permeates and suddenly people who are naked and exposed and shame suddenly find that they can be in your presence, not hiding from your presence in the corner of the workspace. And suddenly they start to understand that actually there is a way that we can be obedient, not disobedient. There is a better way. We can trust this God. We can trust this Jesus that actually has designed for us is life and having it to the full and that his way does lead us to that, that that is truly what truth is, that freedom comes with truth. Freedom is because of a way that we live and people start to come into this atmosphere as we are symbolic of things to come. Will you help those hiding behind the tree to know there is one who's been to the tree and won the victory? Will you help those who are living in the wasteland to move into the garden because the greater grace has made the way for that? Number four, paradise, exclusion and access. See, Adam and Eve begin in paradise, but they forced outside the gates due to the curse. Jesus goes outside the gates to reverse that curse so that we may end up in paradise. Ephesians chapter 2, 12 to 18 says this, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for He Himself is our peace who's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached near to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Access. You see, we were previously by our former way of life excluded, but now as men symbolic of things to come, we have access. And what do we do with that access, friends? One, do we live in that access? And then two, what do we do with it? We're symbolic of things to come. 
I'm a, a very dear friend of mine. He's, he's about 15 years older than me. He leads a church in Durban. His, his name is Nati Zondi. He's a Zulu man. And he went and studied at the University of Zululand. And his roommate was a foreigner who couldn't speak Zulu. And the language of instruction was Zulu. And now Nati had grown up in apartheid South Africa. And, uh, and he just loved the fact that for one moment, he was on the right side of privilege. Because now his roommate couldn't really understand, was battling to learn Zulu and study. And so he was on, see, privilege is not just a white-black thing. Privilege is those that have access and those that don't. And so Nati was gripped by the Spirit of God and said, what are you doing with the privilege you have? What are you doing with the accessibility to language? And so he took it upon himself to tutor his roommate who went on to be a great student and qualify. And I just love that story because Nati in that moment had a choice to, be, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to live in what had, what, what had been uh, committed against him in the apartheid era and he now had, era and he now had the opportunity to, uh, to live in that same manner or he had an opportunity to become symbolic of things to come. He had an opportunity to do with his access to the Zulu language what Jesus, I think, would have done. And so the question I ask just with this is, are you living with access to God? And does God have access to you? And then what are you doing with that access, friends? What are you doing with that access? I've left you with some questions to ponder, and I close out with this. In Acts chapter 11, verses 23, it says this, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. You see, this is what happened. A man called Barnabas went into a community, and he witnessed the evidence of God's grace. Within this community, they had become a people symbolic of things to come. They had moved back into the garden. They had received Jesus' nakedness on the tree to cover shame. They had opened the way for people to move back into paradise even when sin had excluded them. He had made, uh, this is what he saw. And I want to encourage you, Thrive Church. I want to bless you this morning for some of my observations from Friday and Saturday. Because I've come into this community and I've seen the evidence of God's grace. I've seen that this community is symbolic of things to come. And I want to keep calling you to be in greater measure that which Jesus has won for us. But I want to bless you, Thrive Church, for your community which welcomes people in. I want to bless you, church, for your service which is outstanding among the churches. I want to bless you, Thrive for your excellence, which honors God and it inspires people. I want to bless you, Thrive, for your learning, which displays incredible humility. I want to bless you, Thrive Church, for your preparation for all of those who will come to Christ, which reveals your anticipation for your salvation and your desire to do the work of an evangelist. I want to bless you, Thrive, for your generosity, which is a witness to the lavish love of our Father in heaven. And I want to bless you, Thrive, for your presence here this weekend, which reveals the value you have for the bride of Christ and becoming more beautiful each day. Leslie Newbegin says this, the deepest motive for mission is simply the desire to be with Jesus where He is, on the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped dominion of the devil. You are beautiful, friends. And you are called to be men and women symbolic of things to come. And Jesus has paid a great price to give you access into that story. And so would you receive the grace but not just receive it, would you allow the grace of Jesus Christ to permeate you, 
so that you will start to influence the aroma and the atmosphere around you so that others too may come into this journey that you have found with Jesus. Symbolic of things to come. That's what defines us, not the ideas of the generations past, but the voice of our Father in heaven. If you're here this morning and you've never received this grace of Jesus and you've never put your trust in the one who went to a tree and his nakedness took your shame upon himself. But today you'd want to say, hey, Rich, I, I know I need to make this decision. I need to put my trust, my life into the Savior's hands. I'd love to offer you that opportunity. And I'd love just, even while we're in this room, and this is a personal decision, it's not private because we be, we're part of the bride of Christ, and, but it is personal. And so if that's you here, I would so appreciate it. If you could just raise your hand until I acknowledge you because I want to know how to pray. Is there anyone in this room that feels ashamed, that feels they're living under a curse, that feels like they're separated from a loving father, that feels like they don't have access, they're not living, you're not living in a garden, you're not living with the fullness of life, you're not living with the generosity of a loving father, you're not living in that space. I want to tell you, Jesus is the one who makes that way. Is there anyone in this room that would just say, hey, I want to make that decision today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Jesus, we worship you. We thank you that you went back to the garden to overwrite disobedience with obedience. We thank you that you went to the tree naked to overwrite our shame and our nakedness. Thank you that you've made a way back into paradise for us when we lost that. And thank you that you've given us blessing in place of the curse. In Jesus' name we pray. To those that raised their hands, I know the team are going to just come and facilitate your next steps. But Thrive Church, I have a deep affection for you. I've watched you from a distance from Durban and as we've chatted with your pastors and as we've grown to love them, I love you deeply. And I trust that I bring this word to you today, not as just some guest speaker, but as a friend who wants to keep calling you towards the things that God has for you. In Jesus' name, bless you, Thrive Church.